Hello everyone and welcome back to the Andy Wilkins podcast, episode 2, Let's Talk Football, where for basically the next, I don't know, hour maximum, I'm going to be talking about six subjects of which literally 95% of them are all about football. So, um, yeah, let's get into it, really. So... The first thing I'm going to be talking about today is football, and I've titled it as The Heat Is On In Scotland. Um, For those that have seen or follow what's going on in the SPL, Scottish Premier League, um, basically it was quite an interesting one um, this weekend as both Rangers and Celtic drew. Um, Not looking brilliant by any means for Celtic, who do remain 21 points away from Rangers, who are still unbeaten. It has to be mentioned here. Rangers are still unbeaten. Celtic have actually got three games in hand, but that, you know, obviously if you still do the math, 21 points plus take away nine points, you're still, you know, you're still facing deficit. Um, Listening to a load of um, football podcasts that I have been listening to recently, um, a lot of people are saying that realistically it's Rangers is for the losing, basically. And to an extent, some Celtic fans have apparently um, accepted that, look, they're not going to win the league this season, go again next season, so to speak. Um, you know, but apparently the club is in a bit of a state of, um, is, it's in a weird state, because if you look at it from um, the last couple of weeks, months to an extent, um, a lot of the club's fans have been um, wanting Neil Lennon um, to get the sack, because obviously the results haven't been good enough, their Europa League campaign, you could argue, yes it was a tough group, but they should have done a bit better, so to speak, and the fact that they've managed to let Rangers take over um, the top of the league, you know, given that Celtic were going for 10 in a row, after 9 successive um, SPL, you know, league title victories, but I would argue, um, I've written as my little, um, I've, yeah, so, so literally as I've written as my notes here, Celtic are looking likely to be denied a 10th SPL title by Rangers, with Rangers currently 21 points clear over Celtic who have three games in hand. And that is realistically it. Um, Stephen Gerrard has been in the role for about two, three seasons now, I think. And I must admit, I, will, I, I do sort of see the humorous side to it. If Stephen Gerrard manages to win the SPL title with Rangers, but he couldn't win a Premier League title with Liverpool. But that's just me being me. But ultimately, though, what Gerrard has built, it has taken time. It ha- hasn't been, like, say, Pep Guardiola, who literally was given a ton of cash and, you know, was given the ability to, um, you know, make improvements or spend a lot of cash. The money over in Scotland compared to the money here in England is a lot smaller. But then ultimately, the, um, the old firm... Um, duo in Celtic and Rangers do have a lot of sway in being able to, you know, pay for you know players in the other le- in the in the other Scottish teams. You know, for example, I believe they're set to sign a lad from Aberdeen on a pre contract basis, with the Aberdeen manager basically accepting. Look, it's going to happen. You know, I can't stop the lad. Hope hope he goes well for him, sort of thing. That's from my understanding. And it's the same, like, to be quite honest, like, when Celtic and Rangers do try and buy these players from other Scottish teams, they do have a lot of sway, because obviously Celtic and Rangers are the ones in European football every year. You know, what Scottish players get the chance, you know, every now and again you have Aberdeen who make it into the um, group stages of the Europa League. Um, And as we saw, Motherwell had a very good go at trying to secure European qualification as well, but... As things stand, actually, looking at the SPL title, um, looking at the SPL in general, Rangers and Celtic look dead on and um, secure. However, you've got this battle for third right now, and it's going to be very tight. And I think, realistically, it won't change. Because you've got Rangers with 66 points, still unbeaten in 24 games, 21 wins, 3 draws. While Celtic, 21 games played, 13 won, 6 drawn and 2 loss, with 45 points. And then, quite weirdly enough, in four, in first place is Hibernian with 40 points with 20, from 24 games. Though, that, that being said, if Celtic win their three games in hand, it could open up the gap for um, between them and Hibernian or even Aberdeen, who actually are a point behind in fourth place with 39 points. 
again, ironically, only one draw um, being the difference, so to speak, um, at the moment. But that being said, Aberdeen do have two games in hand. Um, and then, obviously, you've got Livingston with 31 points in fifth place from 22 games. And you have then got Dundee United making up sixth place as the last spot in the top half with 28 points from 24 games. Not bad returns that either. They have actually, like looking at their form of their last five, they have drawn four of their last five with one defeat. So make that what you will. Um, they are actually, all fairness to Dundee United, are actually the league's most drawn team so far this season. Um, again, make that what you will. And then, lo and behold, in seventh place, you've got Kilmarnock, um, seventh with 24 points, St Mirren with 23 in eighth. Um, ironically, they have they have conceded three less goals than St Johnston, who are also on the same level of points but in ninth. Um, you've then got Ross County with 20 points from 24. You've then got Motherwell who moved up into 11th um, literally yesterday following their one or draw with Rangers. Um, but again that's all down to goal difference. Um, in fairness that there is a goal difference of, of about minus 12 between Motherwell and Hamilton um, who are both on 19 points. So it's a bit tight down there. Especially if you take a look at Ross County, Motherwell in particular, I was really quite shocked to see sort of how poorly they have done. But ultimately, I do hope, I think it's Graham Alexander who's gone in now. Yeah, Graham Alexander, which came in, I think it was about the other week, ironically. Um, but, you know, credit to, yeah. So what happened was that Stephen Robinson um, was the original manager. Robinson was in for three years. He did really good wonders with, um, and then lo and behold, Graham Alexander came in literally end of 2020, like literally it was around, I think it was around literally New Year, on, yeah, on 7th of January 2021, Alexander was announced the new head coach of Scottish Premiership side, Motherwell, following the departure of Stephen Robinson and replacing interim manager Keith Lasley. Um, but yeah, in all fairness, like, you know, <laughs> Alexander comes from having done a few good jobs, you know, like especially looking at his managerial career, he had a good time, um, he did a good job at Fleetwood from my recollection. Uh, he also did an okay-ish sort of job at Scunthorpe, um, despite how he left things, so to speak. And then, oh, but then, in all fairness, like you know, you you do take a look at Fleetwood, so to speak, and that is actually right now it's his worst. Well, obviously minus Motherwell at the moment, where he has drawn two games. But looking at his win percentage, Fleetwood is actually his worst. But yet, ironically, it's his most amount of games he's managed, so to speak. Come for um, 46.9% win percentage, um, which was just literally just over two years, like literally two years and two days, basically. And then lo and behold, he was in the role at Salford for about two and a half years, where he managed his highest win percentage of 48.2%. But then that being said, you take a look, you know, in all three of his managerial sort of times, uh, obviously minus the um, time he spent at Preston uh, as caretaker, he has managed over 50 wins in each of these clubs that he has been with, so to speak. But obviously, no doubt, um, Motherwell will be a tough gig for him to no doubt take on. But, you know, I've always I've always admired what he has achieved. I think, to an extent, he was a little bit unlucky with what went on at Salford. But then, ultimately, I don't know if that's just me being me. But then, take a look at the SPL table. You know, it is still quite open. Especially, you look... Like, I don't mean harshly, but it's like Kilmarnock have got a game in hand on Dundee, for example. St Mirren have got three games on ha in hand on Dundee. You know, some of these, you know, Motherwell have got two games in hand on St Johnston and Ross County. You know, they have got this, uh, definitely by all means here, Hamilton have even got a game in hand on, um, they've got two games, no, I mean, they've got, they've got a game in hand over Ross County and St Johnston. So again, it could get very, very tight, especially if Hamilton win that game in hand. You know, it really, I don't mean it harshly right now, but it literally is anyone's for the taking, so to speak. Um, of which, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, do I think Rangers will win the league? Yeah, I do think so. Um, I've sat through a few games that Rangers have um, played this season, and I must admit, I like watching Rangers. Because as much as, um, as, much as I have watched a number of their games, I thought, yeah, they, you know, they have played a little bit sloppy here and there. I have often looked at them and thought they have grinded out the result where they have where they have had to grind out the result. There is no sort of, you know, they've had to grind out a few sort of gritty one nils and whatnot. You know, I think in fairness, you take a look at Rangers and 
where you know you take a look at they have managed since the season started for example in August you know they have managed the odd one you know the, for example they managed the one nil victory against Aberdeen on the opening day you're gonna have to grind out results like your one nil here and there you know it sounds great it sounds quite pathetic I say that um, I'm trying to remember the game I watched um, they were away um, yeah I remember watching their game away at Kilmarnock in November and again that was a nitty gritty game and again they had to get the best out of what they, you know, they had to get the best out of the situation they were in. You know, they have to go to places like Kilmarnock. They have to grind out results. And credit to them, they have done just that. You know, they went to, where was it? If I can just double check here, where was it? Um, I think it was about November. I think it was, yeah, I think it was about November. Was it about November? Was it October? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember October. They went to Celtic, and on paper, you know, Celtic were obviously looking, oh, look, you know, this is going to be a big game. But yet, lo and behold, Rangers managed a 2 0 win, and I thought that was a good win for Rangers. Not saying that Celtic aren't doing well enough, you know, by all means, you know, they they are up at the right end of the table, so to speak. But then it's a little bit like you have to sort of look at it and think, you know, right now, any more of a slump from Rangers, and I mean, any more of a slump from Celtic, and Serious questions will be asked, like you know, and I think realistically, Lil, um, Lil, I mean Neil Lennon has, you know, this is I think his second spell in charge of the club, you know, right now, and it's just you know some of the results that you know you take a look at some of the results they've got at the moment, it's not making pretty reading right now, you know, it, it just really isn't making pretty reading, like you know, so you know, right now looking at you know the fact that they drew nil nil against Livingston on Saturday, you know. I'm not trying to be nasty to Livingston, but that should be a game that Celtic should be winning at home without any problems. Again, to an extent, you know, you you take a look at Hibernian, you know, they drew 1-0 at home on, on Monday night. Again, you know, obviously you have to take into factors that the squad is still quite hit from COVID, given that they went to Dubai. They've now come back with a few cases and everything. But then, so far in January, they've been, you know, it's not looking pretty reading. Um, that said, they do actually go back to Livingston on Wednesday. Um, that's a quarter past eight kickoff before having a week off until taking on Hamilton at home, and then on the 30th of January taking on St Mirren. But again, you know, you take a look at, you do take a look at, for example, February on the cards for Celtic right now: Kilmarnock away, Motherwell at home, St Mirren away, St Johnston away, Aberdeen at home, and then ironically it says here Aberdeen at home again for some reason. I don't know why coming up as two lots of Aberdeen games within 10 days but again what do I know um, but it's just it's a weird weird situation right now and you know you take a look at some of these results you know you know by all means you know some of the results were good some of them weren't so good you know you take a look for example you know at least you know you take a look at December for example minus obviously the losses in the Champions League to AC Milan you know, there weren't any real major problems. But then, um, I don't know, do Scott, I mean, I'm going to ask any Celtic fans here, do you feel like as if Neil Lennon does need to go? Do you feel like as if you need someone who's a bit fresh, a bit new? You know, because from an outside perspective, I see it as bringing someone who's got some fresh ideas, bringing some success, because otherwise, no disrespect to you, but the moment as things stand, the momentum that Gerrard is building, so to speak, with Rangers, I would not be surprised if they win the league next season if all the mess that is carrying on at Celtic carries on into next season and beyond, so to speak. Now, by all means, I want to see a competitive league, and you've also got to think of it as well. Aberdeen are looking to rebuild. Ab um, their new owner has said they want to see Aberdeen break the mould of the old firm teams. Who is going to get those opportunities? You know, it's going to be very, very interesting, to say the least, and I think right now the fact that Rangers are sort of waving the flag in European competition, Celtic aren't this season, you know, that sort of learning pedigree that Rangers will get from playing these big European teams, that might benefit them, it might also hinder them, it depends how long really this momentum will last, so to speak, but yeah, I do think personally that Rangers have won the SPL for this season, but again, um, will Celtic come back stronger next season, no idea, but, to be honest, it's going to be an interesting league next season, regardless whatever happens. But, I think, talking about 
sort of top flight leagues. I'm now going to sort of segue on to the Premier League. Um, we've something that I'm not saying I'm not saying this to be nasty, but more just in general, the Premier League table right now is something that I thought we hadn't seen for about a good five six years. Manchester United are still top of the Premier League, 37 points from 18 games, whilst Man City have got 17 points from 35 games. They're actually, it's all down to goal difference of four, or four plus goals, determining them from second place with third, with Leicester being in third, funny enough. Tottenham are in fifth with 33 points, whilst Liverpool are in fourth. It's crazy to see Man United in first place right now. And for me in particular, I grew up with Man United being the dominant team and they were fighting with Chelsea. Um, you know, it was pretty much them or Chelsea who were winning the league every season, so to speak, before City came along with the money. Um, to an extent, same case with Liverpool, um, same case with Tottenham, same case with Leicester, and to an extent, same case with Everton. But then you look at Chelsea right now, Chelsea are in 7th, Arsenal are in 11th. You know, you've got two teams to an extent who are breaking the mould of the top six in Leicester and Everton. Everton are in sixth right now. Chelsea are in seventh. Southampton are trying to break it. In fairness, if it wasn't for the fact that Chelsea have scored seven more goals than Southampton, Southampton would be seventh and Chelsea would be eighth, basically. In fact, actually, I'd say if West Ham had scored eight more goals, West Ham would be seventh. It's remarkable. There is going to be a race for seventh place the way things are carrying on right now. And it is remarkable to see, especially with the League Cup this season. Whoever wins that will guarantee themselves a spot in Europe, regardless of what happens. So, um, like in European football, I think the winners um, are automatically given a place in the European Continental Cup, whatever it's called. It's the new third tier division thing. But then I think that's going to be given to the team that finished in seventh this season, for example. But then I had heard rumours that it was going to be given to the team who finished in eighth. Again, what do I know? But the fact is, is that you've got some, you, you have got European uh, places on offer. And the thing is, right now, you take a look at that top seven, top eight, to an even the extent top nine, and you do. And actually, you know what? I'm going to include top ten. Any one from that, any of those teams from the top ten could grab a European place, whether it be Europa League, whether it be Champions League, whether it be European Continental. It's going to be interesting, regardless. But for those that know or may not know. Man United um, drew 0-0 with Liverpool yesterday at Anfield. And as much as people are looking at it as, oh, it was a game full of wasted potential, I do personally look at it and think, if you have to, Anfield is a tough place to go to right now. You know, I think that's been proven by the fact, I think Liverpool have done something, found a stat that I was really quite impressed with. Um, not just United are unbeaten in their past 16 away matches, but Liverpool are now unbeaten in their past 68 league games at Anfield earning 178 points out of a possible 204 points over that run. Now, I'm not trying to be nasty here, but that is that sort of tells you how sort of dangerous, you know, Anfield has become, so to speak. For, you know, they all, like, by all means, they say, oh, look, you know, you've got to make, you know, you've got to make, uh, you know, your home ground, your fortress. And the thing is, Liverpool have done that, in all fairness. Under Klopp, Liverpool are unbeaten in all seven of their Premier League games at Anfield when facing the side starting the day top of the table by having won three games and drawing four. Um, but the fact is that United and Liverpool go again next week. In fact, United are at Fulham in the league on Wednesday night, Liverpool host Burnley on Thursday night, and then next sun and then on Sunday, um, United and Liverpool take, take on each other again, but this time at Old Trafford in the FA Cup fourth round. In all fairness... I don't know if anyone else is thinking this, but I'm looking at that game thinking whoever loses that could sort of capitalise on what is going to go on. Um, especially right now with how things are going for them. Um, you know, you have to sort of take a look. And you and I think to an extent, whoever wins that game, by all means, might, but might by all means become the winners of the FA Cup. But I do take a look at... Whoever loses it, it could sort of push their momentum in the other competitions. Like you've got to think, Man United lost the Carabao Cup semi-finals um, literally a week, two weeks ago, or whatever. You know, you take a look at that. You know, Liverpool still in the Champions League. You know, you know they, you know, one. You know, in all fairness, they have still both got the European competition. But whoever wins this 
could sort of go, okay, look, we've got that little bit of spare extra time to, you know, push forward something. I don't know, but I didn't actually watch the game last night, contrary to belief. Um, I was busy doing other things, but the thing is, it is definitely an interesting situation. But the thing is, you've got to remember here as well, Man City have got a game in hand. They could easily take top spot, basically, if they win their game in hand with Everton. However, to an extent, Everton win, it throws them in the... Pro I was going to say promotion mix, but it's not promotion mix. Everton win that game, it throws them up to 35 points. Yes, they haven't got the goal difference as of yet, but, you know, give it one or two games, and they could literally be pushing alongside Liverpool and Leicester. Ironic, and I shouldn't be saying this, but right now, if the way Everton carry on, Liverpool could end up playing in the Europa League next season. And I don't wish that to an extent because a team like Liverpool sort of I wouldn't say they deserve it, but they are they are one of them sort of teams that when they have Champions League nights, you know how they know how to make it special. But again though, Everton, seeing them push for European competition. But yet what sort of is a bit I say weird, is that remember how last season Wolves were pushing for European competition? Like Wolves were literally on the doorstep of Champions League football. Few few bad results towards the end of the season, bam, it go it goes for them. It's remarkable. Now look at them, they're fourteenth in the league. But, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see what goes on with the Premier League. Um, you know, because anyone could still win it. Leicester could still win it, Man United could win it, Man City could win it. To an extent, even Tottenham could win it, but then I think in fairness Tottenham have sort of shot themselves in the foot a little bit with recent results. But then it's a little bit like Liverpool, to an extent, have almost become what Leeds became in the 70s with this, oh, we, you know, we like to hate Liverpool. Um, you know, especially to an extent, if Liverpool were to win the league again, it'd be that sort of, men, it would be that sort of momentum of thinking, OK, now we've got to really knock Liverpool off their perch this season because, you know, we can't afford it again. But I don't know, it's, it's a weird, weird situation and it's definitely one that is going to sort of, progress out over the next however many weeks like you've got to remember you know we're not to an extent we're not even at the halfway stage um yet officially minus the likes of brighton brighton and sheffield united palace and one or two others who have played 19 games and are officially at the halfway stage you know you know here we are you know mid-january and you know we're still not entirely beyond the midway you know halfway point yet but it's going to be an interesting sight regardless um but Carrying on with the Premier League, we're now going to go seg segueing off into something a bit... Actually, you know what, I'm going to switch around here, because I was going to do topic number three, but I've just realised that topic number four I can just segue into. Um, Mesut Ozil is apparently set to sign for, for Fenerbahce. However, um, he hasn't played for Arsenal um, since March last year. And in fairness, he has... I'm not saying he's had a bit of a standoff, because I think that's the sort of wrong term to describe it. But with Mesut Ozil, he hasn't played for Arsenal since March. He's been frozen out of the squad. And just realistically, he won't, like he was on about 350k a week, I think it was, something like that. He was, from my understanding, Arsenal's highest earner. And especially given that he wasn't exactly playing, it makes you think... Why have him at the club if he's not, you know, if why pay him, why have him at your club if you're not going to play him? That's, you know, that's what I've always been sort of thought, like, thinking about, what I've always been told. Um, but yeah, he's set to leave for the Turkish side Fenerbahce, which in fairness will be a good move for him. Because for those that know or may not know, he's, I think he is sort of, like, he's got sort of close ties to Turkey as a country anyway, because... I believe he's good friends with um, he, the Turkish president, President Erdogan, I believe his name is. Um, he was actually Ozil's best man at his wedding. Um, but yeah, so there's that sort of closeness in that sense. But um, ironically, from my understanding, um, there was some flight tracker thing from London to Istanbul and ab about 300, about 300,000 people were tracking it Yes, um, last night. So he's arrived in, so Ozil has arrived in Istanbul trying to sort out all the technicalities of the deal, whether he'll go on the loan is unknown, whether he will just terminate his Arsenal deal, because regardless of what people say or not say, he's going to have to go for a sort of a bit of a decrease in play, um, like in wages basically I mean, because no disrespect to you, but Fenerbahce you won't be able to 
fork out £350,000 a week. I'm not saying there isn't the money there, but unlike the Premier League, the Turkish Super League, I believe it's called, isn't the most bankrolled of leagues compared to what we have you know, here in England. But then, by all means, give it time, that could become the case once more. But it's just a weird, weird situation, all in all. Um, but, to be honest, I do feel sort of sorry for Ozil. Because I do think, you know what, you know, it, it could go either way. Um, it could go either way. It could be quite interesting to see what happens, what becomes of it. So, yeah, ironically, here it is. Um, literally, 70, so yesterday, BBC Sport reported that Ozil is set to join Fenerbahce. He, he has travelled. I, well, here's the thing, I saw the tweets, he has travelled to have a medical, um, but I don't know whether this is going to be the case of where he's leaving on loan, or whether he's not leaving on loan, I don't know, you see. Um, especially, for example, uh, Fenerbahce, for example, have suffered financial problems in recent years, um, and ironically, they did actually rule out a move for Ozil in 2019 for economic reasons. Um, yeah, funny enough, it says here, Ozil was born in Germany, but has Turkish heritage, and Fenerbahce, Chairman Ali Kopp um, has previously said that signing Ozil was a nice dream. which in fa And the fact that Ozil has spoken of his admiration for the Turkish side, you know, sort of says it all. He's, um, he apparently said Fenerbahce is like Real Madrid in Spain, the biggest club in the country. Um, but, yeah, um, o even though Ozil said last summer that he would stay with Arsenal through to the last day of his contract in June 2021, Arteta has left him... Uh, has left him out of both their Europa League and Premier League squads this season. Um, he also refused to take a pay cut during the summer, with no football being paid and Arsenal looking to balance the books. And also, at DC United, who were who did sign Wayne Rooney, were strongly linked with a move this month for Ozil. Um, obviously, he's no longer part of the German national team because he retired from that in 2018. Um, and he was, and he's also been criticised because he had a photo taken with Turkish President um, at Dogen, I believe it was, at an event in May, um, and the fact that also Dogen was also the best man at Ozil's wedding um, in June 2019. But then I think personally, I don't know if this is just me being me, but I sort of look at it and I think, you know what, best of luck to the lad, you know, he's, you know, credit to him because it's like he did well during the Arsene Wenger days, you know, he's been at the club for what is it now, seven, nearly eight years, so to speak. You know, he he signed for the club literally in September of 2013 from Real Madrid for a club record, um, 42.4 million. Um, you know, you know that sort of money spent. And in fairness, he did sort of win them, you know, some FA Cups. You know, he did, you know, he did do a sort of good job to an extent. But then it's like, a lot. there is a lot of the fan base that is quite divided, so to speak, with Ozil, because... There's half the fans thinking, oh no, let's have Ozil back in the Arsenal squad. Then there's half of them thinking, nah, you know, it's. I've got a mate of mine who's an Arsenal fan, and he hates Ozil because he thinks he's lazy. He, you know, he, he's got no time for him. But it's it's a weird little situation, all in all. Um, you know, but I wish Ozil all the best of luck because I think you know what he's got the ability here to really do something quite fantastic in Turkey. Um, you know, does it get him back into the limelight that? You know, perhaps, you know, that he could, like, get back to the way he was. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens. You know, the fact is, he's 32 years old. He's still got another couple of years, like, left in him. You know, the fact that some players are still playing up until the age of 36, 37. You know, he's got at least another two, three years, if not even more than that. So, you know, it's a shame about the last year because, you know, when you get to, say, your 30s, you do start to think, oh, look, you know, need to, you know, need to sort of, carry on playing because I've got only a few years left playing but it's one of them things really I'm now going to move on to what was originally going to be my third sort of point like my sort of third topic non-league football um last week I spoke about how the FA are looking to null and void the season and here we are once again um with non-league football being spoken about now I've noticed this already and I sort of wanted to give my sort of brief sort of opinion on it because why not? Um, players are already on the looks. Pl players in non-league football are already looking for new clubs to join ahead of the new season, whenever that may be. And realistically, 
fair play to him. Um, I think, like myself, like many others, I can't see the season carrying on um, through. I can't see the season restarting. I can't see any of that stuff happening. And that's just me being as nice as I can. You know, we're going up to, I think it is, just over a month since I was actually at a live match, in fairness. And the thing is, I can safely say this, you know, I think best of luck to any players who are trying to look for a new club already because it's like some obviously want to know where they are going to be at next season while some obviously want to know where they are where they aren't going to be at you know they want to know if they're going to be at this club if they're going to be at that club you know some are already looking for moves higher up the pyramid and you know what best of luck to them um i can't slate them off because it's just you know i think we've all been in a situation in football where we've had to sort of have a look you know, you get to say January and you're there think you know, you get to say January, February and you you know, whilst you're trying to keep yourself concentrated, you're trying to think, Where am I gonna be next season? You know, I was I was like it in all fairness, as nice as it sounds, I was like it last um January. I was trying to keep an eye on thinking I was I got to January and I was there going, Okay, where am I gonna be at the end of the season? Where am I gonna be at the start of next season? Um, football wise, because I didn't know whether because especially with football, you don't know whether you're coming and going sometimes because you don't. Um, but you know, lo and behold, nothing changed um, for me on the football front, to say the least, anyway, which is always lovely. Um, but, yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's a weird one. It's a weird one. But, you know what, best of luck to any players out there if you are um, trying to look for new clubs. Obviously, we still don't know what's going on. We don't know if the league has been null and voided or anything, but it's always quite good to see players, sort of, to an extent, looking out for themselves, going... Oh look, I need to make sure I'm with a club for next season because some are desperate to get get back out playing. You know, it's you know, but it'll be interesting to see what goes on, um, what players come and go already, because obviously a, um, a situation that many clubs had sort of um, last summer was when was it a right time to sort of announce players like signing for new clubs? Because obviously you can't go. Oh look. You know, you don't want to go in too early, but you don't want to go in too late, so to speak. Um, some announce very early, some announce a bit um, a bit late. You know, it, it really depends, because obviously I remember being at Wakering and I got told, oh, look, we don't want to announce any of the new signings in case any of the other teams, um, st um, like, you know, try and attempt to sign any of our players. You know, that sort of mindset, which I do understand, I do get. But, you know, it works for some teams to announce early, um, I remember when I was at Concord, um, the players were being announced left, right and centre. It was, you know, quite fun. It was, you know, like literally players were being announced almost left, right and centre to an extent. And it was like, OK, you know, welcome, welcome. You know, um, it was just, you know, some teams, some teams prefer to do it early, some teams don't. It really, really works. Um, for it, it can work, it can also not work. It really depends. But, yeah. Um, so that was actually quite a short segment, that. I'm now going to go on to Doctor Who, um, because there has been footage emerging, saying about how the Weekend Angels are set to return. Um, I do apologise, uh, but it's obviously not confirmed yet, but the Weekend Angels are looking likely to um, join the Suntarans. The Suntarans have reportedly been rumoured to be returning for Series 13, for those that may or may not know, Doctor Who Series 13 has been reduced um, for the upcoming season, so to speak. So the Series 13 is going to only have 8 episodes, and it's going to be reduced from 11 due to COVID-19, um, which I believe I may have mentioned last um, week, um, which isn't a problem. But to be honest, I'm looking at it thinking the Weeping Angels haven't been in the Doctor Who episode that he didn't exactly feature in Peter Capaldi's era so I am sort of thinking you know what best of luck to him you know like you know hopefully it's a good story I'm not the biggest fan of the Weeping Angels I'll be the first to admit but if they can sort of reinvent them or do a good storyline to them that makes you think oh you know what that could be a good storyline then so be it you know the, the photos that I will be showing literally about now basically um, overlaid on the Basically, they are of apparently the sightings of the Weeping Angels, but again, whether that's true or not, I don't know. You know, at the end of the day, some of the footage is sort of, you know, not the greatest, but then some of them are sort of not the greatest. It really, really varies. 
But, you know, I think... I'm, I'm not too sure, like, you know, because there's all these rumours about if Jody's going to lose, if, like, you know, the fact that Paige was talking about it. There is now, obviously, YouTube videos and so much more articles going, oh, who's going who's gonna to become the 14th Doctor? And, and I talked about all this last week. But since then, a load of more articles, a load more videos. It's going to be interesting regardless to see what the hell happens. Um, Weeping Angel's back. Uh, to be honest, I like the Santarans. I like the Santarans to an extent more than the Weeping Angels. So I will welcome that massively. Um, but again, it'll be interesting to see how the Weeping Angels do against 13 if they do return. In the same way, you know, we've had Jodie go against the Jadoon, for example. Again, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. But yeah, um, I'm now going to go on to number, topic number 6. That was actually, again, a very short segment. Um, number six, Senkaija, um, and just Super Sentai in general. Um, for those that may have seen my YouTube video, my last video, was me reacting to the Zenkaija trailer. I have sat through it with the English subs, and I must admit, I was left very, very impressed. However, I am not confirming whether it's going to be amazing or not until, obviously, I've sat through the episodes. I was going to be talking about Kira Major like, and about how it's sort of finishing off really quite strongly. However, I've not sat through it for the last couple of weeks because I've just been busy doing other bits and bobs. However, I'm probably going to move that into next week. So, the thing is, with Zenkaija, it's looking to be a very good season. A very, very, very good season, no doubt. Um, again, I'm going to overlay a photo of the Zenkaijas um, here, literally, so you know what they look like. It's a lot of the fan response has been very very positive and to an extent i would say too positive because we know it's going to be hopefully a quite a good anniversary season but it's got to be a good anniversary season that's what i've that's what i think personally anyway it's got to be a good anniversary season it's if you take a look at last as i mentioned on friday's video the anniversary seasons aren't always the most amazing anniversary seasons um you take a look at bukenja you take a look at Gal Ranger. You take a look at Zuoja. Only Go Kaija to me has been a good anniversary season. But then that being said, um, you know Zen Kaija has got so much potential to be this amazing anniversary season. And you've got to remember as well, in five years' time, we've got the 50th anniversary, which hopefully Toei are already working on because that could be one hell of an amazing season. 50 years anniversary. 50th anniversary season, that has got to have something remarkable. Um, but the thing is, you know, Zenkaija does have the ability to be this really good season. Whether it will or not, no clue. But I'm looking forward to it anyway. Um, it's also worth noting at the moment, there is no Versus movie for Kira Major versus Rear Soldier yet. I need to sort of say yet because it's not been confirmed. And normally, it is normally confirmed around by now, oh look, there's going to be a Versus movie. Because in fairness, I was looking forward to Rear Soldier vs. Kira Major. Especially given sort of how different the two teams are. I was thinking, oh, you know what, that could be a really, really good season. And I meant that could be a really good over, like, really good crossover movie. But at the moment that's being stand, nothing has been confirmed. Whether it will come out as a summer movie or something like that, I don't know. I'd like to think, oh, it could come out as a summer movie. It makes sense to come out as a summer movie. Um, but again, we don't know. But then, uh, but then there are a few rumours flying around saying that they might do Kira Major versus Rhea Soldier versus Senkaija, which could make sense because it mean because it makes you think, okay, they then put the forty third, forty fourth, and forty fifth Super Sentai all together. But then you've then got to think, hang on a minute here, you're then going to have a few characters not getting that much sort of ca like um, time for development or you know featuring in the movie, so to speak. It's, it could go nasty for the cast members involved, but then, obviously with COVID, it has shaken things around. Kira Major's run, for example, I think is going to end up being about 46, 48 episodes long, something like that. Which in, fair, which in fairness, it's not going to be the sort of shortest run by any means. And in fairness, they have done really well to sort of work with what they have got. But at the moment, no, Kira Major versus Rear Soldier is a little bit sort of, disappointing because I myself was looking forward to it however obviously we'll see what happens um, but hopefully it does come along whether it be that it 
whether it be that Kiri Major versus Rear Soldier comes along, say, next year, I don't know. But then there's all this talk about how, like, literally after um, Zenkaija came out, people said, oh, you know, you, you can adapt Zenkaija for um, PR. Um, and I thought, yeah, you could. But then in fairness, you could adapt any of, any of the current seasons that haven't been adapted into PR seasons. But as I have mentioned before, and as I will say again, until PR scraps the two-season format, we won't get all of them. And that sounds really quite geeky of me saying that. But until PR scraps the two-season mess, that is quite a mess. It's just, it, I get the fact that, oh, look, it consolidates for toy sales and all that stuff. But the thing is, the one-season, like, flat-out run used to work wonders. It did do wonders. Take a look at, all right, minus, obviously, Operation Overdrive. Take a look at how good some of the one-season wonders were. Again, I didn't like it, the fact that I had to sort of wait till, literally, after Beast Morphers Season 1 came out, I then had to wait however many months for Beast Morphers Season 2 to come out. I was there going, for goodness sake, I don't want to wait an extra bloody year just to sit through it. I'm sounding really self-entitled, and I do apologise, but that is the situation. But then, it's like, I thought Zuoja might be adapted next. I thought Tokuja could have been adapted next. Rear Soldier is a good season and it is up there as one of my favourites. But seriously, like, I don't know anymore. I really don't know. But yeah, um, talking about the schedule for the next couple of weeks, I have actually got some good content that I am making, I am currently sitting through. So, as always, this is episode two, let's talk football. Um, Thursday, I'm going to be talking about my, I'm going to be uploading a video where I talk about my best and worst experiences in football. Because I have had some good experiences, I've also had some bad experiences. On Saturday, I'm going to be rewriting history as the UK in Hearts of Iron 4. Um, so feel free to join me on that. Then next Sat- I mean next Monday, um, the Andy Wilkins podcast, episode 3. No idea what I'm going to be talking about it yet, but obviously we shall see. And then to end off January, at the moment I have got part 1 of a series where I talk about how I'd run Doctor Who. Um, I've decided, you know, I've written up a sort of blog about how how I would run Doctor Who. However, with the fact that I have now been able to, um, I've now managed to sort out Photoshop a bit um, through through uni. Basically, I've now got the ability to create sort of um, like graphics of how my episodes would sort of look like, or the covers of what my episodes would look like, basically. Um, not that that's an issue, it's just one of them things. And then obviously, um, and that should be on Thursday 28th of January, how to how I'd run Doctor Who Part 1, where I talk about my first season, what I'd do, what episodes, what they'd be about, basically. And then Monday 1st of January, the Andy Wilkins Podcast, Episode 4. We begin February, um, hopefully in the best way possible, um, with plenty to talk about. Um, but yeah, I'm, I will obviously talk through what I've got planned for February um, next week. Because why not? But yeah, free video, like two more videos coming out this week, potentially at least, if not more. Depends really how I feel. Uh, might try and include one or two other things. Um, but yeah, we'll see how things go. But if you are new to the channel, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe for more Andy Wilkins podcast videos and just more new general content um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, hopefully, be reacting to a few things, um, doing a few doing a bit of stuff um, I've also got a new mic coming that is actually due to arrive tomorrow so really looking forward to actually upgrading the sort of mic capability so you can hear me a bit better um, so you can hear this lovely lovely sort of I would say posh voice but it can be it can sound posh but I've not exactly got the um, most of Essex I've not exactly got an Essex accent by any means but that is all for me today it's I'm about ironically I'm about 10 minutes short from what I did um, last week so not that I'm knocking it I'll I'll take it but yeah that's all from me and I'll see you all next week Um, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one bye bye